Realtree's Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Cabela's, Easton Arrows, Frigid Forage, Fuse, Grizzly Coolers, Hoyt, Hoyman Tree Sauce, Muddy Outdoors, Nikon, Ozonics, Redneck Blinds, Rocket Broadheads, RTP Outdoors, Trophy Rock, Spot Hog Releases, Wilderness Athlete, Viking Solutions, and Realtree. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. On today's episode, I'm going to talk about entry and exit routes. And this is a subject that I'll hit on uh, repeatedly with any stand location. My philosophy is there's no such thing as a great stand if the deer know that you're hunting it. And I've taken a lot of spots that I thought were probably mediocre stands. As long as I could get in there and hunt it, and the deer didn't know that I was there, I'll eventually have success in those spots. So obviously the best of both worlds is if you have a great spot with great access. So we're dealing again with this spot that we're calling the plow down plot. And this is that food plot that I put down in the valley where we had the plow down clover, tilled it in, planted it to big and beastie, and uh, put the redneck blind down in there. And I talked about it several times while I was down in there about how I was going to access it. And I had this grandiose plan of walking this creek, you know, this mile or whatever to get back up in there. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I was going to be bumping through an awful lot of deer doing that. So I'm going to take uh, a different approach today. And we're going to work through the process of using a ditch to get to a, a stand location. And this is something that I've done a lot over the years on Midwest Whitetail. And if you've watched the series since the beginning, uh, that's probably one of the key themes that you can pick up here is that I use these ditches a lot to get to and from my stand locations. I'm up on the road right now, but not too far off the road, this draw that runs all the way down right behind that redneck blind uh, comes up near the road. So I'm gonna go in a little ways, I'm gonna work my way down to that draw. I'm gonna take the Hoyman pull saw and I'm gonna take my chainsaw and I'm gonna clean out that ditch so that when it comes time to hunt it, I can slip in there quick and quiet. So this first little part of it, I'm just gonna use this lane but I don't want to walk the lane all the way down, although that would be probably a reasonable plan B. I think there will be deer bedded up in this area some if I use this at least for a, an evening hunt coming in in the afternoon. So I'm going to go down here a little ways and I'm going to drop off into that ditch and then work my way down to the blind in the ditch. I really like the Hoyman electric pole saw for this kind of work. We haven't hit anything yet that's real big. If I have to go back and get reinforcements, I'll go and get that chainsaw. But for just typical stuff, you know, like the last one I cut was bigger than my wrist, probably about the size of my forearm. Uh, this thing will handle it just fine. I mean, it does a really good job. It's got a lot of power. The battery's got a lot of staying power. So I'm not in here firing up chainsaws and, and uh, you know, creating a lot more noise and, and uh, disturbance not as much odor or something like this. So there's a lot of upside to using the electric pull saw. Now, you might think that I could just buzz right down through here without cutting this stuff out. But what you find in the dark, it's a whole lot different than in the daylight. And you're tripping over things and you know it just makes it feel a lot slower and a lot noisier trip down. So uh, getting it cleaned out will definitely make the entry and exit a lot easier to this, tree, or to this uh, redneck blind. This is the perfect ditch for what I'm trying to do. Both sides, both banks are probably at least five feet or more above my head. So, and I've done it before where I've walked right past deer that were bedded on the um, higher ground right next to a ditch. This one, you could do that. Might be a little bit crunchy, but it's deep enough and narrow enough that uh, the deer don't really cross it much. They don't walk up and down it. So you're not going to go across places where the deer are going to go and that can leave ground scent where they're going to pick it up. The wind generally blows over the top of these little narrow ditches like this. So it kind of confines your scent into a small area. And then obviously 
being narrow like this, all your sound kind of gets muffled and contained down inside the ditch too. So you can get away with a lot using these spots. Um, they're all over the place. And you may not be able to find a tree stand that you really love next to one of these things. But even if it's a decent tree stand and you've got this kind of perfect no-brainer type of access, that makes that stand a lot better. So take advantage of these routes. Um, ditches are awesome. Uh, creeks can be really good too. And then, uh, you know, anytime you can use terrain features like this, um, take full advantage of it because the biggest challenge that we have as deer hunters in staying successful is keeping the deer from knowing that we're hunting them. That's uh, rule number one, the cardinal rule of bow hunting whitetails. If they know you're hunting them, they're really hard to kill. I really like using a pole saw for this kind of work because you don't have to get <clears throat> right into a multifloral rose bush in order to cut it down. You don't have to get right close to something, you know, where you got a lot of kickback and you know, the possibility of something getting into your eyes or your face. And I can stand five or six feet away and do all the cutting that I need to do, which keeps me safe and just keeps me from getting all scratched up by all this brush. made it to the blind and that was a lot easier than I'd expected. I've been through some of those before where we have real big trees that have blown down into the ditch and then you end up, you can spend half an hour just cutting a little tunnel underneath one tree. But that one was pretty clean, a uh, perfect type of setup to use the Hoyman pole saw. I'm standing here next to the plow down plot and we'll show it to you again. Uh, we showed it to you maybe a couple weeks ago on the show. and. You know, it's starting to curl up. Um, we just need rain so bad. I think next week we're supposed to get some, but you know, we're sitting here with we're sitting here with four or five days yet in the forecast where it's going to be hot and dry. Uh, so if this stuff will just hang in there for another five or six days, we should be able to hopefully get some rain to kick it going again. I can see the wind is starting to kick up a little bit now, and it's a good opportunity since we're down in here to talk about how wind swirls in these valleys. People are always wondering why we keep saying don't hunt down in the bottoms. Uh, you know, we, we try to hunt places where the wind is more consistent, so we stay up on top. So we stay on ridges, uh, flat areas. And the, the problem you run into with valleys or any place where the wind is, or the, the air is protected from the direct flow of the wind, is you get eddy currents, just like you get in a trout stream. So if you use that analogy and you think of a rapids running into a pool, the, the water will flow in really fast in the middle, but those parts of the pool that are off to the side that are protected from that main flow of the water, the water swirls into those. And most times it's actually going upstream against the bank, just on the downward side of, of a rapids. It's exactly the same thing as what we're dealing with down in these low spots. The wind is blowing over the top of the ridges, just like on the rapids and the creek, but then it hits this d uh, dead air space which is on the back side of the ridge and it swirls down in there. So the wind up high is still going straight, but the wind down close to the ground is swirling and actually going in most cases in the opposite direction that the wind up high is going. So that throws your scent all over the place and makes for a really bad situation for hunting. Uh, that's why the redneck ground blind is down in here. I mean, there's some really cool trees here that would be fun to put a tree stand in, but I know I couldn't get away with hunting this because of that fact that I'm down in this valley. There's only one situation where you can sometimes get away with this, uh, and, and that occurs if you've got really still conditions, dead still, so that you only have the thermals, the thermal drift, taking your scent away. And it's gonna take your scent down the valley. So whatever direction the water would go, if you poured a whole bunch of water out, that's the direction that your thermals, uh, uh, that's the direction the thermals are going and taking your scent. So in this case, it'd be flowing down into that ditch that I cut out, down around and, and down to the creek. So I could get away with that on a really dead still conditions out of a tree. But we don't have those very often, unfortunately. We end up with a lot of gusty days, especially in November. We get that sort of turbulent weather conditions that seem to come through. Um, you know, you're not gonna sit down in here with a 20 mile per hour wind and not have every single deer in this whole 
you know, say quarter mile square area um, smelling our scent. It's really hard to control it, even with the ozonics going, when you've got a lot of wind, there's just so much human scent that gets spread in so many different directions. Um, so keep that in mind, anytime the wind or the, the airspace is protected from the direct flow of the wind, you're gonna have swirling. And then the opposite question is, well, what, what happens on the downward side of the valley? If the valley is wide enough, this, the turbulence will, will you know, sort of smooth out, then it'll hit that downwind side and push up. So sometimes you can get away with hunting on the downwind side of a wide valley, but it almost never works hunting on the upwind side of any size valley. Uh, I'm gonna head back up to the truck now. Uh, I'm gonna make any little last second cuts along the way and kick some of the brush out from underfoot so that it can be a quiet exit. But while I'm doing that, let's join uh, Jared Mills and Mike Reed as they introduce their season and talk about what they've got coming up for the fall. September here and Mike and I are finally getting a chance to, to get together and do some things. Um, it's been a busy summer as you can see and we're actually on one of the farms that Mike helps manage right now uh, and one of the food plots that we've had some good luck in. Yeah, as uh, Jared's saying this is one of the farms right outside of town that I help manage. We're actually in the main food plot in the center of the farm right now. It's about an acre and a half and if you remember from a couple years ago this is where I shot uh, that management seven point buck. Uh, this plot is essentially a bunch of pure trophy clover and I came in here this year and put a few uh, spots of Big and Beastie right around the redneck blind and then to help us get in and out of this plot I've been learning over the years where the deer come from and the issues we have with entry and exit so I came in and put the plot screen on all the areas where we walk from from the truck and then along the wood edge to help us get out clean in the evening hoping uh, not to necessarily have to use the coyote howler again but uh, that's in the back pocket if we need to um, this is my third year on this farm and thus far this summer I've gotten two bucks that I have three years of history with now one's Mr. Clean and one is the Crab Claw 10 both of those bucks are five and a half years old they're on the hit list out here I'm sure um, as bucks start shedding their uh, velvet as they're doing now and finding their fall range more mature bucks are going to show up We've actually picked up an extra 55 acres of timber uh, next to this farm, and um, I imagine that's gonna help with sort of holding deer and keeping pressure off of some of the surrounding bedding areas. And it's right on a big river system, so the, both of those timbers will help during the rut, more mature bucks running through here. So I'm looking forward to what might show up as the season progresses. One of the main farms that I hunt has actually been fairly slow this summer. Um, There's a lot of deer that got killed last year in the neighborhood. Um, but one deer did show up on my latest card poll on Sunday. It was a deer I call Callie. And I believe he is six or seven this year. We've had numerous encounters. Um, if you remember last year, he's the, the deer that was very vocal. I think it was a late October hunt, early November hunt. Um, very vocal. We, we passed him up right underneath the tree stand. He's a deer, obviously fully mature, will be hard to pass up um, just from an age standpoint. I think he actually got a little bit smaller this year, but from a history and age standpoint, he's definitely going to be at the top of my list. Um, that farm also, you know, what I think probably the highest scoring deer on that farm right now is a three-year-old that I, I can't wait to see what he does in a couple of years. But there's also a couple of good bucks hanging out on one end of the farm that tend to only be there really early in the year and by mid-October I've lost this one deer for two years in a row now and he shows up and he only stays you know through that first part of October so that'll be one one deer I'm going to watch closely here over the next couple weeks and potentially try to get an early season pattern on him. So I've had an interesting summer down at my farm um, between the neighbor's cows and the drought I've had lots of uh, damage to crop and food plots but 
it's my third year on the farm and uh, in my opinion that's about how long it takes to get a good mature buck crop I've already gotten pictures of eight different bucks that are five and a half or older that I've got multiple years of history with and so really looking forward to uh, hunting the farm this year. Each year I've designed a little bit more with food plots here or there. I've pushed out two new plots this year based on what I've witnessed over the last two years and so I'm really excited to get down there and uh, have a good season. The three main bucks I'm looking forward to hunting this year, one is Hoss. You guys heard me talk about him a lot last year. He's six or seven years old. He actually um, broke his pedicle when he shed uh, this past shed season and grew kind of a big funky antler on the left. His right side's pretty similar, but just a big frame mature buck that I'm really looking forward to hunting. I'm hoping that he moves more into the body of the farm. Last year, he spent uh, basically all of October and November away and then returned during late season. The other two bucks that I've had lots of encounters with over the last two years are 66 and TD Jr. I've been filming these deer since I bought the farm. Uh, they were both three-year-olds and now they're five this year. Jared and I encountered uh, both of them throughout the season last year and into the late season and just passed them every time so we have lots of history with them this year they're both there and they both look good they're both mature so that'll be uh, the three main targets this year on the farm Mike's farm will be a lot of fun with all those mature deer around and we're gonna be spending some time on a few other farms we haven't talked about as well this year one being my dad's farm that's not too far from here it's a farm that I've actually never hunted before um, it's not very big but I think it'll be fun to spend some time out there, try to learn a little bit and spend some time hunting with my brother. So I'm looking forward to see what kind of deer show up and how the, <clears throat> how the hunting is out there. Mike and I's plan over the next couple weeks uh, leading up to the season and then into October is on our video blogs, not only you know share what's going on, but we might take a little time and start profiling some of these deer that, that we're after, we're hoping to show up or have already showed up, whatever. Profile them a little bit more and We've, we're just starting to, to generate so much history with, with some of these bucks and um, kind of use the video blocks to show some of that. So uh, look forward to that. And uh, Mike actually gets to get in a tree this weekend. Yeah, yeah. So uh, per the usual, I've been part of the uh, urban hunt here for eight years now, and that opens up this uh, Saturday. So it's nice because I get to get out in the tree a couple weeks ahead of the regular state opener. Um, you know, I've not had any time between all the farms to get out in town and put out cameras, so I really don't know what's out there, but there's always a bunch of mature bucks. Getting out the first weekend, my goal is to just shoot as many does as I can. I always try to get five that first week, so that's what I'll be focusing on. And if I can get on a, a buck moving in daylight, obviously that's that'll be fun. So I'm going to get some cameras out in town on scrapes here in the next few weeks, maybe when I'm going out for hunts, and eventually I'll get some bucks patterned in town. But I'm just excited to get out in a tree and uh, sling some arrows. So yeah, we'll, we'll keep you guys updated and thanks for watching Mid to Flight Tail. Well, that's it for this week. Next week I should be pulling cards from cameras. So hopefully I've got a few deer to show you. That's always an exciting time. Uh, also, there's a lot of open seasons. Uh, I think Missouri is starting to open now and there's a few other states in the Midwest that are kicking it into high gear. So if you're hunting, good luck. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.